Hello and welcome to the fourth and final part of Betting People with Simon Rowland. Um, now, Simon, we've talked about a whole host of your methods and your experiences within racing, but one thing you've been working on recently, which has attracted an awful lot of positive attention, is a fascinating new way to measure horses, or at least something that is now much more widespread, which is striding data. Now, first of all, tell us basically um, what exactly striding data is that you're measuring and what it can tell your average race fan about a horse. Yeah, uh, the two main components of a horse getting from A to B fast, uh, the speed it travels is, how long its stride is, and how frequently it turns that stride over. It's quite, it's just that simple. Um, if you can figure out how frequently a horse strides, um, you can, and how quickly it was running, you can also back engineer how long its stride was. Now, uh, new technology, total performance data, um, uses something which can record that stride frequency. It's not unlike, as I understand it, what you would have in a Fitbit, which records how many strides, strides you take a day. Mine have gone up in lockdown, I'm glad to say, somewhat <laughs> ironically, uh, walking round and round a, a room. And uh, the stride length of the horse is correlated with its ability, but um, is also very heavily affected by things like the speed of the surface, whether it's going uphill or downhill or round a bend. And so it's quite difficult to isolate the information from that. But the other aspect, the frequency of its striding, or what is known as cadence, is very easy to isolate and isn't really affected by that much by extraneous factors like that. And from that, you can tell quite a lot about the likelihood of a horse staying or not. Sprinters have to be able to stride quickly, otherwise they wouldn't be able to run quickly enough as sprinters. Stayers have to be able to do the opposite um, and actually stride quite slowly, otherwise they expend too much energy along the way. The best horses do a bit of both. Winks could sprint like a sprinter and switch off like a middle distance horse. Stradivarius is a horse who can sprint really good for really well for a furlong or two by increasing his cadence, but basically switches off for a lot of his race as all good stayers do. Now, that isn't an awful lot of use when you're dealing with a bunch of exposed mile handicappers where you pretty much know what they do anyway, although you can get the occasional insight. But it's particularly useful with things like classic hopes at this kind of time of year. And so a year ago, Too Darn Hot was um, quite a short price favourite for the derby. And, uh, how, and in terms of his breeding, there were... Good reason to think he might be a Derby horse, but in terms of his striding, there was no way he was likely to be a, stri a, a Derby horse. He strode like a seven-fold and eight-fold performer. Um, he nearly won the Dante, seemed to empty out towards the end, was returned to seven films in a mile and confirmed himself as a as a top-notcher. Now, that's one that worked out well. Some of them don't work out so well, but... Um, the point, in, as in all horse racing analysis, is to tip the odds in your favour. And um, if you're selective and if you're um, able to do the homework, uh, you can get some good insights, with, particularly in terms of a horse's likely stamina. Um, I mentioned that total performance data puts this on a plate for you. It appears in the results section of At The Races, but you can also do this by um, using advanced video editing technology, slowing the, the pictures down, counting strides, understanding sectionals, and get the same sort of results. And you're likely to find that nobody else is looking at that particular horse in the same sort of way. So um, needless to say, occasionally you can have insights that are really pretty valuable. Well, thank you very much for a very comprehensive explanation there. Um, now, the fact that actually you've got that sort of data accessible um, shows that racing has come a fair way in terms of, you know, making things more accessible for not only the average fan, but also somebody who'd want to take things more seriously. What further steps can the sport take 
um, basically to allow people to analyse it as closely as um, you can do with cricket or football or golf, etc. Yeah, I think even before we take further steps or go into further data, which I, I will move on to, I, I think explaining this to the public more widely is, is a challenge. Uh, I try. Um, I, I would welcome it if more of the media outlets, both printed and broadcast, tried a bit harder also in getting the basic concepts of things like sectionals and striding across to people. Obviously, it can appear very complex and a bit daunting, but, you know, the, the challenge is to show people that there's something there, that it's not just a load of numbers that can actually really not only give you insights, but enhance your enjoyment of the experience. And so I would hope that will happen. In terms of other sort of data points, I'd like to see the idea of horse weights um, explored. I've recommended, including to the BHA uh, and others, that there's a pilot project. So why not, you know, British Champions Day or something like that? We weigh all the horses. We find out the logistical problems. At some point in the future, you might say we can't really do this or it's the expenditure is not justified, but at least give it a go. Um, I wrote something a good few years ago when Abel Friend came across to Ascot and pointed out what a huge horse he was and how he strode and things like that and put it up as a sort of a tale of the tape like a boxing match between him and Solo the French horse and Abel Friend was an absolutely monstrously big horse and I think that's interesting even if he, it doesn't change the way you bet or your overall appreciation of, of racing to know that basically this is David against Goliath um, I think it enhances your enjoyment. And so British Champions Day or an all-weather track during the winter or something like that, find out how it's possible to get that data. What I would be convinced of is that you, and not just, I, I've done some research into horse weights in Hong Kong in the past, that you can get some um, uh some usefulness utility out of of horse weights um recently you had an there was an interview on sky sports racing with roger charlton where he was talking about quadrilateral who's favorite for the 1000 guineas and he he went into great detail about what the horse's weight was and how she'd been 530 kilograms over the winter was now down to i think 510 and that he was aiming for about 485 for her to be at a peak fighting weight, as it were. I think that's fascinating. And I'd love, it would make me much more engaged with the sport if I could see those ebbs and flows and fluctuations along the way. So I'd like to see that happen anyway. Absolutely. And um, I certainly agree with all of that. And, and um, I believe in Hong Kong um, and to a lesser extent um, the US, that sort of data, uh, weight race data is pretty routinely used already, especially, I mean, it's used all across the board in Hong Kong, but um, especially when it does come to elite level racing, it's often used actually for punting purposes. So no, I completely agree with that. Um, going forward, um, obviously racing is at a real crossroads. Um, assuming that the sport could come back and um, come to something like its former position, what change would you like to make to the sport as a whole, if you if you could, putting you in charge of racing here, I realise, but um, or something I do like to ask the interviewees. If I got complete, if I was a benign d dictator or even a malign dictator, I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, there's a few people who I'd send packing, I must admit, but I won't name names here. Um, I think one consequence of recent events is that whether we like it or not, there's going to have to be a bit of pruning. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that's, that's sad and people are going to um, suffer as a result of that race courses, maybe, and, and owners and the like. But the fixture list has seemed uh, rather obese in recent years. It's pretty much impossible for the dedicated 
racing enthusiast to follow all of the action, particularly during the summer. And rather than um, hold our heads in alarm, I think we possibly should embrace a bit of a reduction in the fixture list. I think it could ultimately be for the benefit of racing uh, more focus, less flab. Um, that sounds almost like a mantra for me, actually. Um, no, got no, it's it's not. <laughs> We're all stuck inside. It's absolutely fine to respond to everyone. Um, amongst other things, I wouldn't mind seeing is um, I would something I proposed about ten years ago. Uh, a thing a little bit like the race makers concept. Uh, I was involved in that briefly. I didn't um, follow it through, but I did. I did do a day at um, the St Ledger meeting, in which racing enthusiasts go out and you know make themselves available to the public to explain what's going on. I'd like to see that to be more of an industry wide initiative, and particularly licensed individuals would understand that once in a while, and it really would be fairly infrequently, they'd be expected to sort of step up and inform and educate the public and answer questions before race meetings and after race meetings. By licensed personnel, I mean people like media, people like me, um, as well as trainers and jockeys and even owners and stable staff and, and the like. Um, to give the public, so when you go to Kempton and there's only a few hundred people there and the racing is quite boring, you at least got to hear Roger Charlton do 10 minutes on how he's getting quadrilateral fit for the guineas or something like that. I It would get me to go racing. It would get me more interested in the sport. And I think it's one where everybody in the sport can make a contribution, really. So that might be something to explore. I would give less power to these some of the stakeholders within horse racing. I think it's absolutely crucial that you canvas the opinions of race courses and trainers and jockeys and the like, and that you incorporate that in decisions. But got a danger of, particularly recently, of backseat drivers taking over in horse racing. Um, ultimately, the people who run the sport should be informed by those people and by people like the Horse Racing Betters Forum, but not dictated to by them. And um, I would change the dynamic there, which is a lot easier said than done, but you did give me the authority to change anything I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I give everybody who asks that question the authority to change uh, anything I want to in racing. Um, what's next um, for you now? Uh, because you're still writing all these great pieces and I do heartily recommend um, after watching this that you go and check out Simon's pieces on race reading for at the races um, and you've got bits and pieces elsewhere. What's in the future for Simon Rowland? I wouldn't want anybody to get the impression that I'm, I'm fully employed at Brett and I'm earning about 20% of what I was before and I don't get any payment from the government or unless unless I were to pretty much have no work, in which case I can consider that. So it's coming at a cost to me, but I'm keeping my eye in. As it happens, I've got quite a lot of um, family sort of stuff that means I probably couldn't be working flat out at the moment anyway. One of the things that I was doing um, prior to that all happening was establishing a website for my company, Rogan's Racing Research Limited, mostly as a way of just um, uh, displaying my work, as it were, links to my work, but also there would have been a few commentaries on current developments and some more details, things like standard times that I've calculated that I'd like to share more widely. That's been put on the back burner for a while, but I'm still hoping it might be out uh, possibly before the end of May. Uh, we shall see, but uh, that depends really on quite a lot of things, not least whether suddenly racing does return. Indeed, and I think that's a really good note upon which to end what has been a fascinating and really informative betting people. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Simon. And you, William. All the best to you in the future, and thank you very much for watching.